Maria Royal. I'm with Legislative Council. Uh, this is the first meeting of the PEG Access Study com Committee, which was established by Act 79 this past session. Uh, it's June 27th. We're in room 10 of the State House. Then we're scheduled to start at 10 or thereabouts and run till 11.30 today. So what I'm going to do is just walk through the charge and then your first order of business, as you will see, is to elect a chair and vice chair uh, from among your membership. So I think you're all, you now have hard copies of the charge, so we'll just read through it. Uh, so again, section 27 of Act 79. So there is created a PEG access study committee. The committee shall consider changes to the state's cable franchising authority and develop for legislative consideration alternative regulatory and funding mechanisms to support public educational and government access channels and services to communities across Vermont. The membership includes a member of the Senate, uh, a member of the House, the Commissioner of Public Service or designee, a member of the Public Utility Commission or designee, a representative from the Vermont Access Network selected by its board of directors, a representative from a Vermont cable company selected by the governor, and the executive director of VLCT or designee. In terms of the powers, and we'll go around and do introductions, and then you can elect your chair and vice chair. Uh, powers and duties of the committee. The committee shall consider changes in federal and state law and policy, market trends, and any other matters that have an effect on the availability of or funding for PEG access channels and services in Vermont. The committee shall hold at least one public hearing on the value of PEG access television to Vermont communities, the costs of such programming and services, and funding options. The committee shall solicit input from regulators, communications providers, access management organizations, and any other organizations or individuals it deems appropriate. In terms of assistance, the committee shall be entitled to staff services of the Department of Public Service, the Office of Legislative Council, and the Joint Fiscal Office. In terms of a report, the committee shall report its findings and recommendations in the form of draft legislation to the Senate Committee on Finance and the House Committee on Energy and Technology on or before November 15th of this year. The Commissioner of Public Service shall call the first meeting of the committee, which was to occur before July 1st. The committee shall select a chair and vice chair from among its members at the first meeting. A majority of the membership shall constitute a quorum. A member's physical presence is required in order to count toward a quorum and to vote. And the committee is authorized to meet up to six times and shall cease to exist on December 15th of this year. And then there are the compensation and reimbursement provisions in subsection G. So that is the charge. Maybe uh, if you'd like to do introductions and then have a discussion on your election of a chair and vice chair. We'll start with Mike. I'm Representative Mike Itachka. I'm uh, representing Sean Lott, and I'm on the House Energy and Technology Committee, and uh, we all passed this bill, H. 513. Good morning. My name is Dan Glanville. I'm the Vice President of Government, Regulatory, and Community Investment for Comcast Western New England. and I'm representing Vermont Access Network. I'm Andrea Capiti, I'm a utilities analyst for the Public Utility Commission and they designated me to serve on this committee. I'm Clay Purvis with the um, Department of Public Service uh, and I am also uh, the designated uh, department member for this committee. Okay, would you like to Solicit nominations for chair, vice chair, discussion. Is there a motion on the table? 
I'll, I'll make a motion for chair um, and vice chair. We can do that together. Uh, Lauren Glenn Davidian for chair and uh, Dan Glanville for vice chair. So maybe we'll separate those out in terms mm -hmm. of voting. Mm -hmm. So you have a motion that Lauren Glenn Davidian is the chair. Is there a second? And are you ready to vote? I think we should ask if she. Is she okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Just. A <laughs> I would actually prefer um, to nominate the legislators to be the chair and vice chair of the committees. I think that makes more sense, just for a variety of reasons. But that would be my recommendation. So I don't think being the chair is a position I would take. Um, I, I would second that nomination, Lauren Glenn's nomination, because I do think it's sometimes more effective to have a report that has some very strong advocates who are legislators who are leading that effort, and you get more of a hearing when you go back to the State House. You're saying June. You, you <laughs> <laughs> to nominate the legislators. I like that idea. Further well, discussion? I'll, 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 yeah. I'll second that and uh, nominate uh, Becca for the chair. <laughs> <laughs> I see how this goes. <laughs> I am happy to serve in whatever capacity is helpful to this committee, and I'm also happy to do it as co chairs, however, we want to do it. Or if there are other people that would like to nominate themselves, I'm also happy to entertain <laughs> that idea. But if that is what the committee wants, I'll serve in that capacity. Some further discussion? Seconding. Yeah. Seconding that. Okay, so there's been a second motion nominating Senator Rebecca Ballant as chair, which has been seconded. Any further discussion? Would you like to vote at this time? Uh, I guess we can just vote, yeah? By show of hands? Or, okay? Rebecca for chair, all in favor? <laughs> Okay, I think that's a majority of the membership. So uh, now do we have nominations for vice chair? I'd like to nominate Representative Jan Tatchka for vice chair. Okay, is there a second? second? There's a second, and all in favor? And there you have it. I will turn it over to the chair and vice chair. <laughs> <laughs> and you did have a proposed agenda yes. that was emailed around, so I leave yes, it up to you. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. so. so it says opening statements from members of the study committee. I think it would be useful for all of us to know what lens or frame we're bringing to this conversation. And I, I would recommend starting with the folks who brought this to our attention in the legislature, which, if it's okay with you, Lauren, then to start with you know, basically what is the impetus for why we, we are here. Um, so why don't I just read this statement and sure. I can clarify if there's any other. Um, so thank you very much for the establishment of the PEG Access Study Committee to the legislature. And this provides us an opportunity to take up this work together. A great deal is changing in the world of information services and media delivery. And some of the outcomes that we can anticipate from those trends, and some of them are unknown. Through the work of the PEG Access Study Committee, we hope to be able to make recommendations to the Vermont Legislature that will support the sustainability of public educational and government access TV channels and the 25 community media centers that provide production, training, and management services to communities across the state. Vermont's community media centers produce more than 18,000 hours of local programming each year and employ um, more than 100 staff and utilize about $8 million in cable subscriber revenue to provide value and service to our municipalities, educational institutions, and neighbors. The people that rely on Vermont's community media centers range from municipal officials to community activists, teachers, students, nonprofits from all sectors, people with something <coughs> to say, artists, entertainers, and people who lead public initiatives like this one. Our work is highly regarded across the state. In a recent Vermonter poll, 
Respondents told us that public access television is either somewhat important, 37%, or very important, 41% to them, and that we should be looking into a combination of revenue from local government, state government, philanthropy, and subscription fees in order to address the changing revenue picture in the cable landscape. We look forward to this process. We have ideas to bring to the table as Vermont Access Network, and we're ready to take up the work. And we're optimistic that a creative and sustainable solution can be found to continue this important work, in part through the legislative process. Thank you. Thank you. So, Representative Yantashka, do you mind? Uh, sure. Um, so, one of the concerns is that uh, we need to keep uh, community access television viable. And um, I think that uh, since a lot of the access is now being done via the internet, um, it might be useful to look at funding models. Uh, and uh, uh, I know it's, it's the, the reliance, reliance on cable television revenues uh, has been uh, the primary means of funding at to this point. Uh, I think we need to uh, look at what broader funding capabilities there are in terms of internet access and uh, how that should be uh, done. And can you just remind us, um, Representative, what district you represent and how this issue touches your constituents? Well, actually, yes, I, I represent Charlotte, and Charlotte uh, generally does, most people in Charlotte do not have cable access. We are, we are served by Wastefield Champlain Valley Telecom. Uh, there are some uh, residences uh, in, on the periphery of the Shelburne uh, uh, town line that do have cable access, and so they can get community access television that way. Um, if I access it, it's generally through the internet. Uh, so I, you know, go to the. CCTV uh, URL and, and uh, pick up whatever program I need there. Charlotte is served uh, by the um, by, by having its meetings, its public meetings for the select board and the uh, school board um, recorded by I think BCAM it is. Right. Uh, so that that service is available in terms of uh, government operations, um, okay. and that's valuable. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, happy to uh, be a part of this. Uh, I bring 21 years of experience in the industry, beginning in. 1998, and about two years uh, experience, um, I was a city solicitor in Massachusetts where I actually worked on uh, some cable transactions as well. Um, today, my jurisdiction includes the Western New England region of Comcast, which includes five states of uh, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and of course, Vermont. Um, have a good deal of experience in multiple models of access uh, across that jurisdiction and across the country. So I'm happy to be here to uh, provide some insight into that. Thank you. So um, I'm with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. We're an association of all the cities and towns in the state. And uh, we think that uh, PEG Access TV stations are an invaluable resource for the local governments. They give a voice to our community, and they also provide both accountability and transparency for local governments because so many of our uh, board meetings on the municipal side are televised now. I would put a plug in for also televising school board meetings, but that's a different issue. <laughs> um, so uh, we're, we're happy to be here and look at how can we actually make this a sustainable model going forward. And so, um, in the interest of full disclosure, my child attends BCTV summer camp <laughs> in Brattleboro <laughs> and learns how to do production um, through, through that program there. And it, I have a, a strong affection for our, our local access uh, provider in Brattleboro. As Karen has spoken to, as Mike has spoken to, that we rely on public access TV channels to 
broadcast sh um, meetings that otherwise many of our constituents wouldn't get to. Um, in Wyndham County in particular, we have a, a, an aging population um, and many people get their local news strictly from public access. And so I think we're very concerned long-term, many of my constituents long-term, about how we're gonna create a sustainable funding stream for this invaluable resource. Um, and PD and um, designated by the PUC. Um, the Department of Public Service uh, requested a um, workshop process um, on the declining funding. It was a case that was recently closed, 19-0367-PET. And um, this is a nice follow-on to that um, uh, case that was closed recently um, to look at the funding opportunities and such. And um, the hearing officer in that case recently retired. And uh, so I may have some very basic questions uh, that I hope I can be excused from asking and that you're welcome responding <laughs> to. So, and the commission's happy to participate in this process. You bring up a really excellent point, which is that we're coming with all different levels of knowledge about this. And I know for me, I really am coming from the lens of an advocate and really trying to find a path forward. But I am in no means an expert on this. I feel like I'm coming up to speed. So we all need to feel like we can ask the questions and not feel judged by <laughs> our lack of knowledge. So I think that's the only way we're going to make this a useful endeavor for all of us. So I appreciate you saying that. So I'm um, Clay Purvis with the Department of Public Service, and um, we have um, long, uh, for a long time now, interacted with uh, television stations and cable companies. The PUC is the statewide franchise authority for uh, cable television. Vermont's very different from most other states, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, but most states Franchising is done at a municipal level. Vermont has chosen to franchise cable companies at the state level. So um, the grant of um, the franchise grants that companies like Charter and Comcast and Waitsfield Champlain get, they get from the Public Utility Commission and the Department of Public Services, the uh, public advocate in those proceedings. Uh, when we do a renewal or a new certificate, certificate of public good for a cable company, the primary issues that come up are uh, access to PEG television and, uh, uh, and how the cable companies re uh, interact with um, our 26 PEG stations we have around? 25 centers. 25 centers. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's kind of where we come from, um, looking at the industry long term, you know, folks are moving away from cable television and uh, the law is pretty clear, federal law uh, dictates how much uh, the state can collect from uh, cable subscribers uh, as, as far as the franchise fee, it's 5%. Vermont, in most cases, for most companies, collects the full 5%, and that is the revenue source, or the primary revenue source for AMOs. And so as cable subscriptions decline, so will the revenues. Great, thank you, Clay. Mm -hmm. So one of the things um, that I think would be useful for us before we move on to um, the discussion of how, how we're going to engage the public on this and developing a meeting schedule is really been thinking about this in terms of there being three buckets of issues that we need to wrestle with. And I'm not wedded to this frame at all. This is something I just dashed out here um, while we were all talking, is that I see us needing to discuss a cable franchising authority as it currently exists where we might possibly go from here, what are the federal limitations, what, you know, what is the role of the state in this, uh, legislative um, recommendations on the regulatory landscape, and then funding streams. Those are the three that I sort of fleshed out, but if there are others 
or if you think some of those are in the same bucket, I'm looking to the folks in the room. But I feel like often with these work groups, you've got a small number of times that you're meeting, and I think it can be useful to chunk it out so that we know on particular days we're dealing with particular issues or else we get to the end and we don't have any specific recommendations. And Karen, you I'm sure have been involved in, in other study committees and groups over, so I, I also defer to you on what you think is a good model going forward. I, I think that makes a lot of sense, trying to get all the issues out on the table um, right at the beginning and, and then go back through and discuss them. Do we need to um, establish the ratio of how many people access via cable versus via um, the internet? Perhaps a, a presentation not, from one or more of the AMOs, or I would defer to you, Lauren, um, about just basic background about you know how the 25 are set up and um, how each of them are different and um, the services that are provided. And, yeah, I think that would be how, right. how you see the world. I think that would be helpful, and maybe we could do that in conjunction with Dan, and you can provide the Comcast cable, Vermont cable perspective on it. So we have kind of two sides. Yeah, uh, Matt? Sure. So I, I, maybe four categories. Okay. And maybe we broaden it into a fourth category of uh, peg use. Oh, I, mean, I don't know how we would state that. I haven't right. really thought about it. But fourth, so that we right. could use we subscription. Could. Yeah. Um, and then on, I, I, I get where you're coming from on funding streams, but can yeah. we broaden that a little bit perhaps to go into funding streams and spending? Sure. And the first two sound, sound very good. I, I have a, uh, I can go on for hours on cable franchising authority, so I'm happy to put some <laughs> details. I would right. recommend a lot of caffeine before I go. <laughs> Excellent. So, I th so it sounds also as if you, we're drawing a picture of where we are today. Mm -hmm. What's the current situation? Yes. Um, what is the state's authority to actually require funding in different realms? Yeah. Are there any federal preemptions on state authority? And then um, possible and, and ways forward in terms of alternative funding streams available through the legislature. And then I think what Dan is raising are questions of um, economies of scale, how we're structured, if there are different ways to think about the delivery of service locally and delivery of service statewide. Is that sure? Yeah. I think it'd be helpful to also um, look at where there are holes. Um, where, for instance, we don't have access to a PEG TV station in where I live, nor do we have access to internet. So um, I get my information when I come into Montpelier or go to the coffee shop, and, and I'm not alone in that respect. So you're in a peg desert. I'm in just a like in an IT desert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and it's only 12 miles outside of Montpelier. <laughs> right. Sounds like paradise. Just an <laughs> <a> IT <laughs> desert. <laughs> you look all and, and so do we have a map? Yeah, we can uh, produce the, uh, both the map have. of uh, the franchise towns, so most towns are franchised, some are not, as well as a, a cable plan. So that would be great. Produce. So I think for the next meeting for us to be able to, to look at a map. Um, and we have a map of the access centers across the state. Yes, we also have that as well. Yeah. And so what I also hear from the group is having representatives come in from some of those um, access channels to become come in and talk to us about the work that they do and where they are, is that? True. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure I'm reading the, the group right in terms of having a background of all the different services that they they provide and how they connect. And I'm sure. Sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's good, but also um, some, some data on where the funding is and how, how it's been trending. And, you know, cable subscriptions are going down, but the cost of cables going up, and not, you know how that all. And I know we saw a lot of that in the PUC proceeding, but probably it would be beneficial for uh, the committee to have have that and 
So Clay, who best to su supply that data? I want to make sure that I leave here with a, a list of people that I need to reach out to to invite them in. So who would you? Well, we can certainly provide data on the operations of the access centers and where they are and examples of the service that we provide. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a, in the proceeding there was a line graph which mm -hmm. had all the different revenue. Um, forget who. I can do a fund trending just for our 22, yeah. but it would, be, it would be limited to that. I can do a fund trending since we got into the marketplace in 2006. Okay. Seeing VTEL and Waitsfield. And, um, yeah. yeah. And I think it gives, I mean, Lauren Glenn, I would defer to you. I think it's a pretty good snapshot of, of overall trending. Yeah, and we have the, the other yeah. revenue sources that you had asked about. In addition to cable subscription, how are access centers funding themselves? What's the prospect of them diversifying revenue philanthropically or other ways. Um, I think, Karen, what, if I understand you correctly, you're raising a kind of bigger question, which is if the value of PEG is to provide open government and weave communities together, and there's this public good associated with PEG, but there are communities that don't have this public good. Mm -hmm. Or I would probably more likely portions of communities that, that don't, don't have public good. Mm -hmm. Is there um, is there something in our thinking that would then provide opportunities to extend the service? I mean, if we break out of the cable mo funding model, mm -hmm. if there are alternative funding models, what are the implications for extending the service to those? You know, if, for example, and I know there's federal preemption issues, but if, for example, there was some kind of internet fee, just that's a much, it's a different audience than the cable. Mm -hmm. So, would we, ex would we extend the service to these other places? How do you do it? So I, I think that, um, I, that's a viable question. I think that um, maybe also a larger question is, like how do people get their information? And if you, maybe you get it from the internet, maybe you get it from your tech station, maybe um, you, you, don't have, you need to have access to something, I think. And there are places in the state where that is not the case today. Yeah. There's a difference between the ability to access it and the, um, the services provided, right? The money that goes towards um, right. that, what that is, is actually mm -hmm. you know, available, that you could access it if you were in a different location or something. Um, so I, I guess I want to kind of understand that. Too. Can you frame that question for me one more time just to make sure I get it? Yeah, thinking about the access to the information as opposed to the production of the information and the um, effort that goes into um, contributing. Mm -hmm. so, um, so perhaps one way to think about it is the services that are provided by a community media center that are funded primar primarily by cable subscribers with some other revenue sources. And then there's the reach of the content and the public benefit of the availability of this content, whether you're a cable subscriber or not, right? right? Yeah. So there's, I mean, that, that reach is funded by, by these revenue sources, but it's no longer confined to cable television because there's now internet distribution of this content. Right. So, so a person may not have access at their resident, but that, that uh, person's town government could be using it in order to, gener to record the meetings and things like that. And uh, then if that person did have access to the internet someplace else, they could get mm -hmm. Yeah, I live in Northfield, and um, Facebook Live they, they, they broadcast on Facebook Live. So even if I just had a cell phone signal and not a uh, you know, Wi-Fi connection, I could view from that, mm -hmm. that, that way. So. Well, this highlights <clears throat> just how, with, with any of these topics, as soon as you start pulling one thread, you see how it's connected to others. Because I'm realizing now that the subscription, for lack of a better word, is, is, is kind of a slippery concept here, because you may not ever watch public access on your television. You may only be streaming it through your phone or, and, and that, that those are still people who are using the service that we might not capture them in who we think has access at their, 
at their homes. And it's obvious, but I think it's good to make it explicit that it actually, in many ways, serves more people than you might think initially based on who's watching it at home. And to your point, Karen, there are also people who don't have access at all unless they're traveling somewhere else outside of their region. So um, this is the nature of connectivity in Vermont, as you know, Clay, very well. Um, what are the other questions that people feel like we need to wrestle with up front or, or background that people feel like they need in order to feel equipped to discuss these topics with some base of knowledge? To the extent that we have time, um, maybe we could go into some of the regulatory issues mm -hmm. uh, because uh, we've got another hour. <laughs> Just make good use of it. I agree. I agree. I just want to make sure there are people in the room here who can really, I think that'd be a great place to start. Are you saying today? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And so the question is who, who, in the, who among us or in the room can give us the background on the, the regulatory landscape? Because I think you're right. I think it's a good use of our time on this first day. Yeah. Uh, I think there's admittedly came unprepared to do that. Right. Um, Understood. Uh, we could put something together maybe for the next meeting. You can talk a little bit, kind of introduce it. Yeah. Um, uh, as a kind of a way to get uh, acclimated. Um, it's really boring, um, but it's uh, important, I think. So. I think it's absolutely important. So I wonder, Clay, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but would it be useful for us to take a few minutes break and for you to think out about? Yeah, what, yeah let's do that. Can we do that? Yep. And and come back in, like, how much time would you like? 10, 15 minutes? 10, 10 minutes is good. Let's do that. And then you can get your thoughts together and um, figure out what information would be useful to us. But I think Representative Yantashka is right. We're here. It's always hard to get a group together. Mm -hmm. So instead of just going to the next meeting, let's use this time well. And but I think one thing that would help me would be to know if there are, you know, aspects of funding that are just not possible because of yes. preemption, and so that we can kind of yep. put that aside and not um, waste our time and not waste our time yeah. thinking about that. Great. Yeah. Dan, did you you had you said that you uh, could talk about it extensively, so you probably got a lot of knowledge on. That. I'd be happy to Great. Uh, to offer some uh, some background on it. Great. Dan yeah, would be a good counterpoint. So. Yeah. Okay. Great. So let's take a let's take a ten minute break and meet back up, and then we'll get as much background as we can, and that will help us figure out what other questions we need to get answered for the next time. Does that sound good? Great. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. It's live. <laughs> So we should, um, we were remiss in mentioning that um, we are uh, recording this for broadcast. Um, and to work on media. And, and the Department of Public oh, Service. Oh, okay. yeah, So this mm -hmm. is broadcast oh, on the website. Oh, that's your camera. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, we can do that and also record the uh, meeting. It might be helpful when it uh, goes back online to... Um, have a discussion about meeting minutes because we were unclear as to whether we needed to take minutes. Hmm. Maria, do you have? I think we, Maria questions? and I spoke about this a little bit, but might, maybe it's a decision that the committee makes. Yeah, I'm not certain whether minutes are required. I'm just not certain, especially if you have the recording. Uh, but maybe you know we can certainly do minutes that briefly kind of summarize the actions taken. Okay. Sometimes you call them meeting notes so that you don't get into a whole detailed yeah. um, yeah. legal issue. <laughs> okay. And as far as some of these documents that we have here, it would be good to uh, get them maybe uh, electronically. Uh, <coughs> I can send them. I can uh, talk to you, um, Peggy Delaney, and she can help us to or help you to have a committee assistant from Legislative Council who can help with the scheduling and the posting of documents and minutes or notes or anything. So, for future meetings. Excellent. So, uh, Lauren. <coughs> 
handed out um, service territory maps and then the just a little fact sheet thanks to Kevin Christopher our president of the thank, thank you, you. Yeah. and I will send electronic versions of that to Maria I can make hard copies right now if anybody else needs them anyone out there need copies okay. can I maybe get yes you can have one of each and I'll yeah sure okay so, does it make sense to start with Clay, or does it make sense to start with Dan? Maybe Clay. I can start. Dan okay. will be in it probably uh, much more knowledgeable about uh, cable franchising than I am. Um, Middle cable franchising is something I've worked on a lot at the department and have had uh, involvement in it testified in a few uh, cable cases, um, but it's not something that comes up that often because cable franchises are usually given on an 11 year basis. So um, I guess I'll start at the beginning. Um, there was a time when rural areas did not have access to broadcast TV, so going back to the 70s and the 50s. Yeah, when, when broadcast TV developed, it was really an urban, suburban uh, amenity or uh, public good that uh, folks in rural Pennsylvania were not um, able to get. And uh, the hills, the terrain, mm -hmm. we, we know like the reason our cell phones don't work, right. uh, same with broadcast TV. <coughs> and. Uh, Someone in rural Pennsylvania got the idea of uh, you know, beaming signals in on satellites and running lines, or actually broadcast antennas on the top of mountains right. that they could then um, rebroadcast using um, cabling to people's homes, and that's how cable television developed. Um, we had cable television uh, developing here in Vermont as early, as early as the late 70s. 50s. 50s, we had cable in the 50s, so you know more about this history than I do. I'm thinking of companies like Transvideo. Um, uh, that, that to me, I think is the earliest one, right? Well, in, the, yeah. in the 82, there were 50 cable companies in Vermont. Uh, right. So these were individual cable operators, and um, that market has consolidated over time. And today we have 10 cable companies. Um, the biggest are Charter and Comcast. Uh, Waitsfield, Champlain Valley comes in at around uh, three. And then we have some smaller ones, uh, Duncan Cable, um, Southern Vermont Cable, uh, Transvideo in Northfield, Stowe Cable. <coughs> so we have lots of little cable companies all over Vermont as well. Um, some, most of them have peg channels, not all of them. Um, I believe Stowe and Duncan have informal pegs, public access TV stations. They don't have formal agreements. VTEL also has a very large cable plant. They provide cable um, in, in all of their telephone exchanges. So, um, so we, have, we have about 10 companies. Uh, in, the, in the early 80s, uh, the, the federal government passed legislation that um, started to regulate cable companies. And for purposes of PEG, uh, federal law delineates kind of the, or sets the guardrails for what uh, franchising authorities can do um, with regard to PEG and, and um, just in general, really. Um, so the, the big thing is a cap on the franchise fees that uh, local franchising authorities can levy on cable subscribers. Which I, the law says that you know, cable companies are responsible for it, but they can pass it on to their customers. So uh, if you look at your cable bill, you probably have a, um, a franchise fee it's listed somehow. It could be like peg access fee or something like that. In most cases, it's the maximum 5%. I believe some cable companies have lesser uh, amount, like uh, Southern Vermont, I do not believe charges the full 5%. Sure. But maybe you know. Two. Two. They do two percent. Um, so uh, the the idea there, the, the franchise fee is something that local franchising authorities can pretty much do anything with. I don't think there's any federal limitation 
on what you can do with that money. You can buy fire trucks with it or uh, pave the roads or most, most franchising authorities use it to support um, public access TV. Um, and nationally, that may not be true. That might not be true. I okay. think many franchising authorities put their money in the general fund. Yes, and some states, um, <coughs> like my beloved Virginia, has a prohibition on uh, levying franchise fees. So not every state is, um, or local uh, uh, franchising authority is actually levying the, the fee. But we're allowed to do it, and we do it. Yep. So are the, are the fees on the franchise, or are the fees on the subscribers? So, uh, I, I would say both. We defer to Dan, but he, they can certainly pass that fee on to subscribers. So it, it is a line item on your bill. Do you want me to? Sure. So the, um, the, the federal audit is, is set up so that I, we, Clay gave a great history of, of how, how franchising came about and what it was determined at the time, it was defined as what was called a cable service. And today, the video portion of what we provide is still defined as a cable service. And it is the franchise fee that is put on the cable service uh, up to the federal cap maximum of, of 5%. Clay's correct that that does vary from uh, jurisdiction, to jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Some, we're, on average, we're closer to 5%. There are some that look at it in other jurisdictions where it could be lower. But on average, we're probably closer to 5% in those areas that uh, do allow for it. It does vary by state on how the dollars are allocated. For instance, in Massachusetts, it's very specific that it's to be used for cable purposes. Uh, and I think in New Hampshire, there is much more broad discretion as there is in other jurisdictions of how it can be utilized. So that does vary by uh, state organization. But I think in most cases, it's predominantly used for the provision of uh, peg access programming. Uh, so the 5% cap is there. There is a provision that allows for capital uh, revenue as well. Capital revenue is distinct and different from the 5% uh, cap. It's specifically, uh, we could go on for days talking about what capital is. Uh, it's specifically outlined as to what we traditionally know capital as. Uh, here in Vermont, most of the AMOs I think are capped at 5%, but there are some that have an additional quarter percent or an additional half percent. Uh, which would be the capital portion of that, which which could increase that. On top of the 5%. On top of the 5%. Okay. And is that um, passed on to the customer? They are. Well? Every, okay. Yeah, so the, there's also a provision of, uh, of federal law that's outlined in the franchise agreement that the uh, dollars negotiated for uh, franchise fees associated with cable service. I talk with my hands a lot. I hope no, it's not just I'm Hungarian. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, there is a, uh, and I lose my train of thought when I tell people I do that. Uh, so so uh, help me again with that. What was that question? Well, the franchise fee, the capital is a half percent. Oh, how it's passed through. Yeah, there's a provision of federal law that allows cable providers to pass through the cost to uh, subscribers. We specifically outline that on, on bills as to what it is. And if I could just clarify, just so everyone knows, there's the Communications Act of 1934, and that has a section in it, which is the Cable Communications Act of 1984. And so just as a PS, when PEG was first funded in Vermont, the Cable Communications Act of 84 did not exist yet. So the first funding came through in April, and then the Cable Act was passed. So despite the fact that there wasn't federal requirement, Vermont felt that it was important. But the Cable Act controls all of what the state does. And, and Vermont has had, as you point out, a long history supporting uh, PEG access with, with that franchise fee. It's never deviated from that. So, uh. And so if I could just to clarify, there is nothing statutorily that insists that you must use the franchise fee for a particular thing here in Vermont. Is that, is that true? That is my understanding. Uh, I would defer to Clay on that. Yeah, we'll okay. look that up. But okay. I'm I pretty sure it. that there is uh, um, no, um, yeah, no, no requirement that the money be used to support PEG. It's just something that I think is developed through the mm -hmm. history um, <coughs> of cable television and 
the decision that Vermont had made from the beginning was to support paying with that franchise fee. If I can just add to it, so the, the, the federal law outlines it as, uh, so when you're negotiating franchises, it looks at, you're to look at the future cable related needs uh, and you consider the cost of meeting those needs. Uh, so that's the provision that it outlines. And in most jurisdictions, it's a broad understanding of what the cable related need is. So as a result, the funding is, is, it is probably a little bit broad as well. So it allows for, where it's predominantly used for peg access, it does have some uh, discretion in other jurisdictions. Whereas some, some jurisdictions do have a very tight uh, definition that would be utilized for PEG programming. And, and you would see that, for instance, in what it, in statutorily, the CPG here, the Certificate of Public Good, gives the authority. And the specifics under the Certificate of Public Good in Vermont is that we then negotiate with the access management organizations. And so it's pretty clear that the funding here is to go in that direction. Okay. Right. So, yeah, so I didn't get to state law yet. Um, right. So the federal act basically says there is there may be a fran there is a franchising authority and that franchising authority may require up to five percent for cable related purposes up to the discretion of the franchising authority and then capital funding that may be over and above that and that they may pass through it and then the state franchising authority the state then says here's our here are guiding rails, and that's what you're going to talk about now, which is PSA 30 and Rule 8, and where we lay out the details of this arrangement. So, Lauren, you said 5%, and you said 2%. What's the difference? There's a 5% cap in the federal, so the federal law says the franchising authority make up to 5%. And in Vermont, it's 2%. No, it's 5%. We were talking about a small provider in southern Vermont. Yeah. So there's a range in Vermont, and most of the providers most of the providers pass through 5% to their cable subscribers, but in the case of Central Vermont, it's 2%. So and that's determined when the CPG is issued? That's Correct. when you negotiate. Yeah, it's actually a contract between the oh, okay. um, cable provider and the peg access station. Yeah, we do separate, so, we do separate meetings with all of the AMOs to negotiate our agreements. So historically, that was negotiated in the CPG process, okay. and at a certain point, in the early 2000s, it became a contract discussion as a side agreement to the CPG. Right. So, so can I just ask one question about the federal law? Is there any um, likelihood that those parameters are going to change, like well, at the federal well, level? The, the, uh, well, that's a good question, and I think we can only speculate. Um, I, I'm not up to date on what's happening or not happening in Washington. I think, though, that uh, the more likely scenario is that the market will change around the law. So you're going to see um, an eventual end of quote unquote cable service. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> I've gotten by for almost a decade now without cable television. Couldn't be happier. Um, and a lot of people are moving that way. So Netflix doesn't pay the five percent. But there is there are FCC proceedings that are of interest to us and that yes. will play themselves out this summer, mm -hmm. which have to do with um, a, a number of questions related to what is admissible payment um, for franchise fees and other aspects that have a kind of deregulatory aspect to it from the FCC. But the, these rulemakings are going to have an impact, but we're not sure what. And they're going to roll in the middle of July, end of July, on the most recent rulemaking. But to be clear, that won't change the statutes. That, that won't change, change the statutes. The FCC's interpretation of how those statutes are enforced. Mm -hmm. and, the, and I think the thing, you know this, but I think it's just important to point out, is that c cable law, probably like every law, communications law, is this dance between Congress, the FCC, and the courts. So Congress passes a law, the FCC implements as the administrative body, people don't like what the FCC interpret, they go to court. The court then throws it back to the FCC. The FCC tries again, Congress says, mm, we're going to take it back and rewrite the law. So there's this constant um, 
process that happens and that the you know, evolution of telecommunications laws come from that process, can you say? It's fair. It's fair. I, think, I think that does happen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so in Vermont, uh, unlike most states, we have decided that we will do franchising at the state level. So the Public Utility Commission grants cable companies a CPG, a Certificate of Public Good, uh, to operate a cable plant. Um, can, can I just state one thing? Yeah. We do have a pending CPG that we're all involved in, or three of us at this table yes. are involved in, and four of us at this table are involved in. Uh, so. I, I was remiss in not pulling the two of you aside, but um, I think we can get through meeting one without. I just want to state yeah. that. So yes, yes. there is. is this, a, uh, just so I that I understand, you're saying in the interest of full disclosure, is that what you're saying? Yeah, we have a proceeding before we're in mediation right now as a okay. result of a federal court proceeding, and also as a result of the federal court proceeding, we'll be meeting on July 11th. Uh, so. We have been uh, we've been having very productive meetings, uh, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, yeah. involving multiple people at this table. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, great. I just and, and as an aside, it made it made the agency. Yeah. Right. 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 Four people. Four, four, four actually. The four. Four. Yes. Yeah. Is yeah. also involved. Yeah. And and the department. And yeah, and, and most of the audience. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Um, okay. But yeah, I'm not we, personally we involved with the person in the Yes, yes, Kyle. But if um, we could possibly schedule the next meeting after July 11th. July 11th. Yeah. Um, You're saying to schedule this meeting? This meeting, yes. Okay. And is there, given that Work at TV is here and that we're, we're having this conversation in front of people who will be watching it, are there things that people watching this need to know about this issue that you just brought up? Does it impact the conversation that we're having here? No, I don't think it does. Okay. And I don't think it, so far anyone has even jumped into that water. I just wanted Great. to put that out there. And it's, it's not, it, we're in a proceeding. It's not adversarial per se. Right. And we, we, we've been making good progress. Wonderful. I just want to make sure any, are there any other elephants in the room that I <laughs> am not aware of? Probably, but I'm not aware of them either. Okay, great. As it becomes clear, <laughs> in the interest of full transparency, I think we just need to yes. be really clear where we're all coming from. That's right. all I'm saying. Yeah, great. Thank you. So, Clay, we've got about 20 minutes. So, great. I, what else? I can wrap this up in yeah. less than 20. Um, yeah. uh, we grant uh, on a town by town basis. So, um, Comcast, if it wants to serve a new town, would have to come to the PC and get a CPG to serve that new town. Um, and we have a cable franchise map, which I can bring to the next meeting. It'll show you the territories. Um, peg stations uh, are generally designated for particular communities, so there are multiple peg stations in a single cable franchise territory. Um, I believe you said Comcast has 22, and VTEL I think has two or three. Charter has a couple. Um, and um, they each negotiate separate um, uh, contracts with those AMOs. Um, and that is per board rule. Um, uh, PEGs are able to um, uh, have access to channel capacity. It's a big issue. Um, that, uh, or not an issue, rather, but uh, a, 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 a right or a factor uh, of peg stations that are allowed to um, be broadcast, rebroadcast by the cable provider. Um, they are um, um, allowed to have facilities. Um, that Dan spoke to the capital budget. Um, they are allowed um, uh, in certain areas for remote transmission, so they can do this live broadcast through the cable plan. Um, and please chime in, Lauren, if you have uh, things to add. Well, you're talking about yeah. Rule 8. Rule 8, yes. Right, so, so. There, so Rule 8 is what lays out what the cable operator's obligations are overall for the entire, to be, to receive a certificate of public good. Right. And a subset of that is 8.4, which outlines the responsibilities of a cable operator to provide PEG access and how they may do it. And essentially, they may delegate it to what is called an access management organization, which receives this funding and is obliged to execute certain 
um, services on behalf of the community, proxy in effect for the cable operator. So what you're describing are essentially the operating and capital resources that we have to work with, and that's outlined along with our obligations to provide reports and to be accountable for the dollars. Yeah, so Rule 8 does provide, um, I'll, I, would, I would think, a significant amount of structure on how the uh, cable companies interact with um, tech TV. So um, certainly worth uh, reading <coughs> that. Um, and specifically 8.4. 8.4, okay. yes. So this uh, Rule 8 series governs all PC rules related to uh, cable service. So as well as things like rates and um, you know, customer interactions. Um, one important part of the rule is line extensions. So um, as you've heard me say to all of you before, we don't regulate the internet. We do regulate cable video, and so there's a rule in here about how cable video plans should be expanded. Um, and so that's uh, uh, somewhat pertinent to this conversation. Um, it's a clear rule as to how uh, new subscribers can get service. So since, um, since the state does not have any jurisdiction over the internet by FCC rules, um, is there anything that the state can do in order to address the fact that a lot of people get their access to PEG through the internet? Well, certainly it's been discussed in the past whether a similar franchise fee could be levied on internet subscriptions. I think the answer is no. Um, not only is, but we can certainly talk about it, be a point of discussion. Yeah. Um, but uh, there are two federal laws. There's the general uh, FCC policy on, um, on the you know, jurisdictional limits of the internet. Uh, uh, internet regulation, it's federally regulated and they're not going to regulate it. And then there's a law that prohibits the taxation of internet subscriptions. It's called so, the Internet Freedom Act. Yes, freedom for tax. No, that's another law. Um, sorry, I got my internet tax laws confused. But yes, it's a, a federal law that prohibits the states from levying a tax on internet subscriptions. Internet only. So I think that understanding what the statutes are and what the federal preemptions are, and if there are any asterisks to those federal preemptions, would be helpful for us to perhaps legislative council might help as well as the people at this table. So when if we take up that section of um, legislative recommendations on regulation or funding streams, that would be pertinent mm -hmm. research. Maria, does that feel? <coughs> and so logistically, once you get in touch with um, Peggy at Ledge Council, we'll figure out who's sending out information mm -hmm. to the to the committee. Yep. Great. Yeah. Can I add to that as well? Sure. And, and, and if you'd like, I'd be happy to have a presentation for our next meeting. Yeah. Just on some specifics with that. Uh, but maybe also if, they, if the council's office could look to other jurisdictions, uh, I think that some similar New England jurisdictions have looked at a franchise fee on other video providers. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe look at how they did that so that we could have a discussion surrounding that. Yeah. I'm, pretty, uh, I, I'm pretty sure some New England states did. Great. So if you're, will you, I can, as you uh, are able to speak, think of some more specifics to, to put Maria sort of sure. you know, chasing that down, I think any clues to help her figure out where to look. I'll get some useful. detail on that. Oh, and, and if I can, I'll provide it to you before next meeting. Yes, and, and one last thing, I've always been intrigued by uh, a section in the cable rules on a statewide AMO and um, on what? Having a statewide AMO and other so AMO is Access Management Organization. Okay, sorry, I lost the L. We love acronyms. Yes, we have lots of acronyms <laughs> in and cable TV. So what does the AMO do? Uh, well, an access management organization is what the PEG stations are. They okay. Run the they PEG are station. the AMOs. Yeah. Okay. So did you have a? Are you fascinated because you just not maybe sure an where area came from? Yeah, yeah. not sure um, why this is in there and whether it's a tool that could be looked at as a 
way forward. Or way forward, yes. Yeah. So in the cable statutes, there is a section that contemplates the establishment of a statewide access management organization. And that was contemplated at a time when we were negotiating with Adelphia for a statewide TV channel. And then the question was, well, who would run this TV channel? So this rule was rewritten around that time. And so language in it basically says that an entity could come to the PUC and apply to be the, the entity to run a statewide PEG resource. And that could be a channel, it could be a network. I mean, it, that's evolved over time, but that's, it's a placeholder for when an entity wants to come and do that. And that's something Vermont Access Network is prepared, has prepared to do. We have not yet filed to do that, but that might be an example of an entity appropriate to do so. So in, in, in that event, all the um, individual AMOs would evaporate? No, in that event, the um, Vermont Access Network, which is the mutual aid society for the AMOs around the state, would um, essentially be a management organization if we're, we were going to collaborate on a statewide channel, for example. Okay. It would be the entity that would say, we're, we, there is there, there. Uh -huh. We are an entity, as opposed to these 25 access centers, which are kind of amorphous. Right? One of those access centers could say, I want to be the statewide entity also. But in this case, we've kind of put our weight behind VAN being our representative to help manage a statewide resource if one were to emerge. Okay. So it's a placeholder. It's, a, it's, okay. it's an as, it's a, what's it, aspirational. <laughs> Other things that you wanted to tell us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions that folks have at this point? Yeah, what's the next meeting? Right, and so what I just heard these folks saying is they would like it to be after July 11th, correct? If that's okay. Yeah. So I was just going to propose the third Thursday of the month as a way to start the conversation. Get out our calendars here. If you want, we want to have a regular. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we can pick. That'd be And then that so. Works for me. That works for me. I'm not sure if that interferes with people's summer plans, but that's one way. That's, that would be the 18th of July. It would be the 18th of July and the um, 16th, 15th of August. With the, uh, so for, I can do the 15th of August, but I was wondering, is there any way we could do the 19th of July? Sure. Sure. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm actually away <coughs> on the 16th of August, so, but. But the 23rd work for you? Um, I mean the 22nd? I'm sorry. The 22nd would work, the 23rd would not. Does the 22nd work for folks? Actually, that would be better for me. The 22nd of August, yes. Okay. So, so I'm sorry, Dan, you said 719. Yeah, the 19th of July, if possible, 22nd of August works for me, as long as okay. I'm back at Aerosmith that evening. So <laughs> and then September. <laughs> Whoa! September. <laughs> Damn! Damn! That's nice. September would be the 19th of September. September 20th, Friday. Are these all Zoom meetings? Ten, this time is best for me. Okay. Yeah. Sure. 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 Gives me time to get up from Brow Girl. Me too. Yeah, but I'm wondering though, should we extend the time a little bit? More than 90 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Okay. I, I set the first meeting at okay. 90 minutes purely because I have to be in Linden at 1. Right. So okay. that was selfish on my part. Great. Today. That's yes. not it's not always. Right. And then is it OK if we stop after 3 to, and then maybe reschedule some more once our calendars fill up a little bit? Because I feel like if I go into October, I'm going to be lying about my availability. I, I agree. OK. 
So I've got July 19th, August 22nd, and September 20th. Okay. And block out uh, 10 to 12.30? That'd be great. Yeah, Does that, that sounds good. Okay. So can we do those dates again? Would you mind repeating those? Sure. July 19th, yep. August 22nd, and September 20th. Perfect. And we're going to do 2.5 hours. Same question. And so, so either here or room 11 if this room isn't available. And so we should revisit October, November schedule in August. Just, is that right? That would be perfect. Yes. I'd, yeah, I just feel like I'd be, I'd be being dishonest. Yes. Understood. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your time. I know it's it's hard for all of us, and I appreciate you uh, giving your time to this effort because it's important to a lot of, of our Vermonters. Yes. So, thank thank you. you very much. So we can talk about public process at the next meeting. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, so, and Just as a, an aside, we are broadcasting this on our website. We'll do a more formal um, uh, announcement about that for the next meeting. Great. So just to, be, just to clarify, uh, the next meeting and the one in September on Fridays, but the one in August is on Thursday. That's right. A question about that. So I, I thought the provisions were that we would have seven meetings and one public hearing. Is that is that what, the way it was set up? No more than six meetings. No more. Than, okay. I, six meetings and is a public hearing one of those meetings or an addition? Separate. I remember there being a public meeting. I thought I read that. Yeah, in there is. Right. There's a public hearing. I, I think the way that we had when we wrote the amendment was that that was one of the six. Okay. Was the, okay. So I guess it would be good to open every meeting, maybe open every meeting with that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I think at the beginning of the meeting is better because if we wait till the end, we may not get to it. I, I agree. Any, object any objections to that? Does, does 20 minutes seem reasonable? Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, 15, I mean, 15 or 20, but we can certainly always be flexible. Sure. But. And, and if there's nobody there that wants to say anything, we dive into the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can structure some times for public, for inviting witnesses. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Right, exactly. because if we identify functional experts, then I, I can actually have people come in yeah. as well. Exactly. You know, those are being necessary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because although the people in my house, I might tell them I know everything I do not. <laughs> But they believe you because they, they don't believe you. 